prayer. As we uh, just gather the last of our folk, I would like to start today by acknowledging the traditional owners on the land on which we gather, the Wadjuk people, and pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging. We gather in a pretty special place here today, in addition to some beautiful sunshine and uh, lovely ocean breezes. We have a really strong connection here to a place where the river meets the sea. A gathering place for local Wajak people, historically. A place of stories, a place of history, and now a modern port city facing unprecedented growth and also challenges as it redefines itself for a new era. For those of you who haven't met me before, my name is Janesha Quinlan, and in addition to being your MC for this morning, I am also CEO of the Fremantle Chamber of Commerce. Responsible for representing the diverse businesses of our regional economy, and working to bring together our traders, merchants, innovators in a concerted voice as our charter has read since 1873. Some of you may have heard in my pre-conference video a quote that's pretty close to my heart and it's by local author Tim Winton. For me these words are such a useful starting point to consider the blue economy and the opportunity that draws us here into this room today. We are not sea people by way of being great mariners, but more of a coastal people, content on the edge of things. There is more bounty, more possibility for us in a vista that moves, rolls, surges, twists, rears up and changes from minute to minute. The innate human feeling from the veranda is that if you look out to sea long enough, something will turn up. So what are we looking to turn up today? I'm certainly looking forward to putting our toes in the water and gaining some insight from the incredible diversity of sectors linked in this room. To see the role that the partners that have brought you together, 4Blue, PTYLTD, the City of Fremantle and us here at the Chamber can play from this point to bring conversations together and continue to work with you to find some common ground in the growth in the blue economy. I'd really like to start also by thanking Andrew and his team at 4Blue who have kindly donated so much time and energy to pull this morning together and will also be working to gather the thoughts and summations and dialogue from today to share with all of us so that we can continue the conversation into the future. I'd also like to thank Freo Startup Fest and West Tech Fest who are sharing the stage across today. We will be streaming today's discussion and sharing it across our digital partner, our partners' digital channels, um, so you will be able to see it and, and go over it and hopefully share it with some of your colleagues and others in your organisations. And I speak, I guess, for Andrew, myself and, and the representatives from the city here. We're so keen to continue to hear your feedback um, and continue just outside this room. Now, as I look across the room, I feel very certain that if something quite extraordinary doesn't come out of today's discussion, um, with the calibre of really interesting perspectives that we have here, then I'm going to be really, really surprised. We have participating founders, CEOs, consultants, senior executives and elected members represented here in the room, from organisations as diverse as Austal, to our own chamber members here in Fremantle, L3 Harris and Fremantle Octopus, from Ames to Mindaroo, from Sealink to Fremantle Ports and such a variety of other leaders. And the common thing that draws us into this room is the understanding of the opportunity that drives much of the way that we do business and in many ways defines our business. A sense of stepping off the veranda and exploring ways to generate an income or to protect a way of life that emerges from the ocean bounty or ocean experiences right here on our doorsteps. Now, it gives me great pleasure to introduce our first speaker of the day, who I'm secretly hoping his own personal label is simply just Super Yacht. I think it would be great just to walk around all day and just go Super Yacht. Um, but I know that Mark has spent a long career um, and a lot of hard work ensuring that he can walk around and say Super Yacht all day. Mark is the owner and managing director of Eco Marine Group, boasting the Super Yacht brand Eco Yachts. Until recently, Mark was also 50% share in the True North Adventure Cruises, the award-winning Australian boutique cruise company, and also oversaw the build of their 50-metre cruise vessel MV True North. Mark originally trained and worked as a licensed aircraft maintenance engineer and was head of marine sales at Cummins Diesel. It always makes me smile when I hear Cummins, Di Cummins Diesel as we had to share with one of our exporters recently applying for a certificate of Australian origin that 
They don't necessarily get made in Australia, Mark, and I'm pretty sure I'm <laughs> right on that one. But uh, he managed to get a uh, statement of origin rather than a certificate of Australian origin. But I digress. Throughout his career, Mark has built a livelihood of manufacturing and selling a variety of vessels from cray boats and small ferries to the creation of a new fleet of 1447.5 metre high speed ferries through a three year build program. I understand Mark is also a professional skydiver, a recreational scuba diver and a professional landscape photographer. So Mark, I'm very much looking forward to your perspectives. I hope you can cover all three of those air, land and sea um, interests and passions um, through the presentation, but I'll hand over to you now. Thanks very much. Okay, so I've called this presentation Blue Gold because I believe that we've got a hidden asset in the, in the gold within the blue that we have in Western Australia, which you'll see with some of the slideshows and presentations I'll do in a little minute. But I think the secret behind accessing the gold that's within the blue is to not overburden it with, you know, with tourism and, and dump a whole heap of cruise boats and stuff on it. I think the secret is to access uh, things like super yachts coming to our state to either build new or come down and get refitted because these guys, are, they're only a small amount of people but they've, they're high net worth individuals and, and they will bring all sorts of opportunities in, in uh, refuelling and, and logistics and the likes. So, alright, so summary what we need here in WA to realise what I believe is, is this potential, this, this blue gold. So we need less red tapes to get yachts into the region. That's, that's a big one because there is a fair bit of red tape right now, especially because of COVID. We lost $12 million worth of work we had to turn away because of COVID, which I get, you know, but, but let's, let's realise from the future that these, these guys are going to be an important part of our blue economy coming, get moving forward. We need more infrastructure down the coast and in Perth to attract and cater for these yachts and infrastructure as in marinas and, and support facilities and things like that. We're currently lacking any reasonable berthing options for these yachts. You know, the, the White Rabbit was backed into Carlos's yard before it left. And, um, you know, it's just compared to what's available in Queensland and some other areas around the world, it's seriously lacking. And, um, you know, I think a, a good brainstorming session with how, how we can come up with some better options there would be great. Uh, as it says in there, the um, Queensland currently in, in, enjoys about $60 million worth of refit work a year just in super yachts alone, and that's growing all the time, and they're just a, a private investors just investing very heavily over there to um, end up with better lifting facilities and berthing facilities. And, uh, and as I've said all through the thing, that uh, all yachts that come here bring a lot of bang for their buck, and um, you know, for the amount of people that, that are actually going to come into our beautiful location. We don't want to overcrowd this thing, you know. The one thing that really hit me in the eye last year travelling was just how many people are in Europe, you know, with your just hordes and hordes of tourists. And it's not an enjoyable experience at all. We don't want to kill what we got here, but we do want to maximise the opportunity out of, you know, being smart. That's pretty much the end of my talk, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you. Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, today we're discussing growing our natural advantage. WA has a magnificent coastline stretching out to the Indian Ocean and we all have access to this amazing natural resource. To discuss our blue economy, we have on the panel today um, Dirk Zeller, Director of The Sea Around Us, focusing on research with a global focus. Carmen Elric Barr, WA State Chair of the Australian Coastal Society, who looks at research and coastal management. Brett McCallum, Director of Bracel Consulting, who is involved with fisheries. And Robert Bell, Director of Blue Shift, uh, sorry, so we have, um, sorry, Brett, no, Rob. Robert Bell, Director of Blue Shift Consulting, looking at aquaculture. So welcome to the panel. Okay, we'll start with our first question. Um, how do we balance the ecological health with the economic growth of the blue economy in WA? Um, who would like to start? Rob? I can start uh, by, uh, I guess, pointing out in aquaculture in WA, it's such a small industry at the moment, we don't actually have any onshore commercial aquaculture, which is you know, one of the areas that, of concern for um, uh, ecological um, damage or ecological impact. Um, we have th three offshore 
areas at the moment which have only one or a uh, very small number of operators on them. So at this stage, the ecological uh, impacts or concerns around aquaculture are, are quite minor. Um, and we also have a very rigorous planning uh, and environmental impact assessment process um, to, to manage aquaculture. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Leander. Um, my background being in commercial fisheries, um, most of the fisheries management probably for the last 40 years has been based on ecologically based fisheries management. And you might have heard of ecological fisheries based management, ESD, all of these things that uh, were brought through early in the 90s. The fishing industry has been actively involved because of the fact it's licensed in having to meet these sorts of um, ecological requirements while maintaining fisheries. So a lot of the fisheries management arrangements in place in today's world um, are not just looking after the stock that you're targeting, but looking after all of the in ecology around which that, that fishing stock lives. And um, the, the amount of effort and the time and the types of strategies that are used within fisheries management, contemporary fisheries management today, is more about ensuring that you've got the greater long-term sustainability of the stock and the environment around it and making more money out of less than previously the life was you were king if you caught a lot. So uh, today's fisheries management and the, the, the mindset in which fishermen are operating is very much based around building on the whole of the environment and ecological approach rather than just uh, just catching as much fish as possible. I guess we're quite down the line. Um, well, from a coastal management perspective, and I think even from a marine management perspective, a lot of my work is around social values, so what do people value? And I think one of the things that we're probably not doing as strongly as we could in the coastal space is starting to think about what do we want our coast to look like in the future. So I think we're talking about visioning that's happening in Fremantle at the moment in relation to the port moving. Um, this isn't something that's happening to a strong degree in relation to our coasts. So we know that the climate's changing, that the sea level is rising, that we're experiencing coastal erosion. Same things are happening in terms of rising ocean temperatures and the impacts on uh, um, really valuable reef systems in WA. Um, but there isn't a high degree of forward planning and incorporating the community within that. So what are the visions that we want for these regions? How do our ecological systems contribute to those visions? not only of us personally, but also, you know, to maintain our ecological health, and then in turn, how can we plan to get towards those visions? And I think that by having that really strong basis, we can start thinking about, well, how does our economic element contribute, you know, or fit in within those processes? Hi, I'm not sure, oops. I'm not sure if you actually know what the sea around us is, so just a quick word, and I know I can keep myself short and not ramble. Um, we are an international non-profit global project that uses big data science to look at the effects of fishing on marine ecosystems, and we do this globally. So we don't have competitive advantage at the WA level, for example, where there's other people who have much better expertise in fisheries than, than we do. Um, but we always bring a global perspective to everything. Um, and so with regards to the question about balancing, I want to say one word answer very carefully. And I want to echo what Mark said. We've got to be very careful about how we expand, how we do everything. And we've already heard that both in aquaculture and in local fisheries, that value adding rather than maximizing catch, for example, should be the way to go. Um, and I think lobster fisheries is quite good at doing that. They're lucky because they've got a high value product. Not all fisheries have a high value product. But we need to think very carefully about every step of expanding, of changing, because things are changing. Climate change, we already heard that, we're going to hear that again. So we need to take all of these things into account as we expand or as we change things down the line. So, carefully. What risks do we face in growing our natural advantage? Maybe, Carmen, if we start with you. <laughs> um, I think it probably reflects something that I've already said, and I think climate change is one of our big risks in relation to our blue economy and the things that we have available to us moving forward. Um, I think one of the challenges that we face is that we don't necessarily have a broad policy on how we're going to start responding to some of these challenges. So I think the climate change, state climate change policy just came out recently, the last day or so, and there's been a 
big focus on carbon abatement opportunities um, on land, but I haven't seen that translate into oceans as yet. And I think that that's something moving forward, that as we start to generate more research around these different opportunities, where we have the capability to do so, we'll be in a better place to be able to respond to some of these challenges that we're facing. Brett. Yeah, I think uh, building on what Mark and Carmen have said, we, we have a big coastline. Um, we don't have a lot of infrastructure up and down that coastline that Mark's talking about being able to bring a, a more of a, um, a movement up and down the coast. You know, we're based at Fremantle, we go to Rotto, you can't go many other places. You go to the Abrolis, maybe the Montebello's in Exmouth, but there's not a lot of places in between. But to do that needs the planning, and I think the planning is really important. We tend to be really ad hoc in this state, I think, over the years. We're sort of, here's something that's happening, let's put something here, let's put something there. We don't, we don't take the whole of coastal approach. And certainly from a commercial fishing perspective, everybody thinks, oh, that's out at sea, why would coastal development affect you? But we have a lot of inshore fisheries, we have a lot of uh, uh, fisheries that, uh, that start in the shallows and we end up in the deep like our, our lobsters, and we, we have recreational fisheries as well that are, that are world-renowned that we need to look at which are close to inshore. And every time you have a, a, a development that's not properly assessed or not properly built into a longer-term plan, Maybe the Ocean Reef Marine is a classic case at the moment where it sounds like a real good idea to build a thousand houses on that area, but what are we having the impact on the abalone fishery for about a third of the abalone reef around that area? Um, could be impacted, what do you do about that? Um, do you go and reseed? Do you go and do something else? But that plan seems to be ad hoc and you know, maybe we need a, a Minister for Coastal Development or, or a bit more of a, a, um, a dedicated view of what we're going to do from the high water mark out, rather than we always tend to apply land-based approaches to the coastal development. And I think that a, a more dedicated view of the ocean would be the way to go. Just quickly picking up on that, that risk, um, um, for a lot of the um, ocean and coastal activities that we undertake uh, rely on the health of the ocean. We still live in a country in states where we discharge sewage into the ocean and uh, you know, that, that's a short-sighted, um, I think, uh, disposal option. If we want to keep valuing the marine environment, we need to, uh, to start looking at other options similar to how we've been looking at other options for, uh, for energy. Um, we've heard about uh, ecological risk and, and planning risk is an, another area I'd just like to maybe point um, to another area of risk and risk management is, is the commercial risk, um, particularly in aquaculture. Um, we are seeing possibly a, another renaissance in the area. I've got a piece at the moment I'm just writing. A, I think as of today, there's 14 listed ASX um, aquaculture companies at the moment. Um, but um, we can't afford to have uh, what happened really during the last boom in aquaculture is many of those companies fail. We need to be able to attract capital um, to develop not only aquaculture but other industries. Fisheries is going through intergenerational change of, uh, of ownership of licences and we need capital um, in order to realistically expand on those potentials. But we need that, that capital to be uh, risk um, managed and, uh, and made, I guess, a little bit less risky and so that's going to um, basically require um, you know, better financial analysis feasibility um, and also you know, possibly the introduction of you know, family companies at the moment, superannuation funds and that that are all looking for um, you know, hunting the next narwhal, as I call it, you know, the next uh, ocean unicorn um, and this space has got plenty of opportunities. Um, so we've heard quite a bit about risk, planning risk and all the need to plan terrestrial and marine. I want to bring it back to ecology because one of the biggest risks that we're facing here, and it was already alluded to, is what climate change will do. And one of the things that we all need to realize is all the species in the ocean, they're, going to, they're moving south, all of them. So we, as a society and as government, we need to start thinking, what are we going to do, for example, about those fisheries that are working currently at the northern end of the range of that species? Because those species, those fish in the north, or lobster, whatever it is, they will disappear at some point because their distributions are moving south. So I think that needs to be wrapped into our thinking as a society and in our long-term planning because there will be better opportunities in the south, but it will disappear in the north. 
And how do you do this in a free and open society where people have families in local communities that might be up north, where in 20 or 30 years' time, that fishery may not be valid anymore or capable anymore there, but it might still work quite well in the south. So I think we need to start thinking about this in a larger context. Mm. How is technology impacting on our blue growth? I think we're seeing a, um, a comparison with the agricultural sector at the moment where ag tech is, uh, is booming at the moment and um, is really leveraging um, existing competitive advantages we have. In the blue economy space, you know, similarly, we're seeing uh, lots of uh, uh, work around the digitalisation of everything um, in the salmon industry in Australia, which is our largest aquaculture sector. Um, you know, lots of work around things like uh, artificial intelligence to help with feeding of animals and uh, precise nutrition, um, uh, the ability to count and measure biomass in water um, using drones and uh, other uh, remote um, visualisation of, of uh, opportunities. Um, and along with all of the marine uh, or maritime technology that is spinning out of the oil and gas sector and transforming into other sectors like boat building and um, maritime uh, um, construction at the moment. I think there's probably a few more people on the panel that talk about that area better than me. Thanks, Rob. From a uh, commercial fishing point of view, as I said before, it's, it's now about catching smarter rather than catching more. And uh, part of changing the fisheries management over the last 30, 40 years has been to increase the certainty in the longevity of the access that a fisherman has to the stock. You give that longer term um, opportunity to maintain that access, they're going to have greater confidence to invest. And when they have greater confidence to invest, they'll look at investing in innovation. And that innovation means you are more comfortable in putting in a different type of operation, uh, maybe a greener operation. We now have a, a hybrid vessel operating down in the Patagonian toothfish that, that hide, and electric and, and diesel mark touched before about the greening of boats. So those sorts of innovations are making people more effective at what they do. Um, catching techniques, there's new gear, there's new types of um, innovation in threat abatement for threatened species and those sorts of things around. We had an, um, a very simple fishery in Western Australia, the, the, the simple octopus fishery, which 15 years ago, I think we have our Fremantle octopus friends over here, um, 15 years ago was a, a hand-to-mouth type fishery, $2 a kilo, $3 a kilo on the beach. Um, the industry looked at it, somebody invested some time and effort, they came up with a, with a particular type of fishing trap which, which caught the octopus when it went into the trap rather than only being in there when you pulled it. And it's revolutionised the fishery. It's now $17, $18 on the beach or something like that, Glenn, for a fisherman. Um, and the product, as you all know, you've all been to high-class restaurants. It's now one of the, the known products. So innovation without catching heaps more product has allowed the industries to develop and become more commercial and competitive. So the same in fisheries management, data collection, a whole bunch of things like that has made us better at understanding how to manage the fisheries. So being able to have that certainty to invest in the R&D and certainty to invest in your business um, gives you a greater opportunity to, to invest in that innovation which builds. Dick. Um, so in my field, which is the data science field in, in fisheries, the biggest technological improvements have been twofold. One is the availability of satellite derived data globally now. And the second thing is the increasing growth in machine learning and artificial intelligence. Uh, computer algorithms that help you process data and detect patterns in the data that you can't yourself see. And these are the biggest developments over the last few years and they're ramping up around the world in, in my field. What all of that, however, needs to lead to is an agreement of data transparency. If the data, in my case fisheries, which the fish in the ocean is a public resource. Once it's caught by a fisherman, it's owned by the fisherman. But while it's in the ocean, it's a public resource. Therefore, we're talking about a public resource and there should be data transparency. So all data associated with fisheries in that context should actually be readily available. So data transparency is the only hiccup in the technology uh, revolution that I'm seeing in my field. What innovations are you seeing in your sector? Carmen, if we start. 
Um, I think there's a few innovations that we're seeing at the moment. Uh, some of them largely would be around the different types of um, artificial reef systems that we're seeing through sort of 3D printing of artificial reefs, looking at different um, geopolymers for the concrete offshore systems that we're having. And UWA recently inst installed a, a wave flume, which is looking at how those reef systems might potentially abate some of the impact and energy on our coasts. Um, so moving forward in relation to um, protecting our coastal foreshores, these are some of the innovations that we're seeing. Um, in terms of social innovations, I think we're seeing um, grassroots push for more integrated approaches to responding to lots of the issues that they're seeing at the moment. And this has been driven not only through the changes in climate, but also through a decline in the policy support and the funding support that they've been receiving. So this is seen as sort of a push for collective um, management, trying to, we've started to establish a coastal and marine community network, which is looking at trying to achieve three core objectives through coordination um, of data information, ensuring that that information that's been collected is shareable, um, coordination of effort, capacity building, and also raising awareness and profile of the coast um, and marine systems. So that's sort of two very different innovations that we're seeing. Great. Yeah, I think, as I touched before, I think fisheries management has been a, a major innovation. Um, we've moved from boats out there and trying to um, keep the effort down to reach a certain catch to moving the majority of fisheries now to quota. Um, quota means that you have the flexibility to decide how you will build your business plan around how you're going to catch your quota. And so it gives a much, um, it removes that race to fish that we've had in the past. Um, which meant everybody built the same boat. Mark used to probably build 50 cray boats a year. Um, now we'd be lucky if we built three in the last five years. Um, so people, ha and, and those three boats are now three times the bigger they used to be. They carry six tonne of live lobsters. And the innovation in water tanks and quality control and all of those sorts of things are building more and more that we get a greater return out of our blue economy or certainly out of our fish resources for a, over a longer period of time. But the fisheries management has moved with it to give that certainty and that confidence. We have new techniques to allow us to do independent assessments of stocks without having to send boats out there doing hours and hours of, of work. Um, the harvest strategies are now being built um, within every fisheries management plan so that there are clear triggers as to when certain things should happen. So it gives a greater awareness to not only the fishers, the managers, but also the wider community as to how the industry is going to move forward. And I think the, the broader innovation will need to come with climate change. As Dirk says, the, 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 the species will move south. Where we used to have zones, that meant suddenly all the fish move past your zone, and you're not allowed to cross the line. With quota, I think you, it's a much more flexible arrangement being able to manage that. You can move your, your fleet up and down the coast so long as you're maintaining that quota balance. So that sort of innovation from a management approach I think is going to be the key in fisheries as well. Um, globally there's a lot of innovation in the aquaculture space. Two areas I just want to touch on that might be relevant for WA. Um, firstly is selective breeding. If you um, compare aquaculture with other forms of protein production, so for example chickens, pigs, beef. Um, those industries have had 2,000 years, or in the case of chickens, maybe 40 or 50 years of selective breeding, which have allowed those animals to be produced at a lower cost, a faster growth rate, uh, more resistant to disease, more efficient in their feed conversion ratios. And we're seeing that in aquaculture and, and there's a lot of headroom um, in, in that space. Um, and we're seeing new species come into the aquaculture space and then selective breeding rapidly advancing their performance in the market. Um, the other area of innovation is around, um, I guess, the support of innovation. And countries like Singapore, um, certainly Norway, Bergen, and that have these essentially accelerators and uh, incubators that are there to try to rapidly commercialise new ideas and build advantage for their nation and, uh, and their region and uh, I think that's an area that uh, WA could, could look at 
um, carefully to take nascent ideas, put them into a lab or workshop and then quickly get them out into the market. Um, I've already referenced that in terms of AI and satellite, so that's the main innovation. Okay, how can we harness our natural advantage in WA for greater economic benefit? Please go ahead, Dirk. I want to I want to slightly change tack here because I'm a professor at UWA. I teach, and I think one of the greatest, maybe undertapped resource we have is actually the capacity building and the educational capacity that we have here. And I work a lot with with colleagues and scientists around the Indian Ocean Rim, Indian Ocean Rim countries, and they are desperate for capacity building, for uh, bringing our techniques and our knowledge to them or training their people. And I found it, I've been here for four years now, I've not been able yet to bring a single qualified candidate from East Africa to come here and do a PhD with, in my lab. Because the scholarships aren't there, the resources aren't there. There is an unfortunate bias in getting Australian scholarships for people from developing countries because of their competitiveness. They might come from the best university in their country but if you then compete in Australia, a scholarship for someone who went to Stanford, right, or even University of Sydney, they're not competitive. So I think that is where something where particularly the Australian government, but maybe also the state government, should think about the possibility to actually tap into this capacity building market and educational market, and not just focus on China for this, but also focus on the rest of the Indian Ocean Rim. We're sitting here with the only big, highly developed country in the Indian Ocean Rim. Okay. We should be leading this as an opportunity. So I just wanted to throw this educational tack into it that we, because there's also a resource that we should utilize. Rob. I'd reflect a little bit on what Dirk said there about building um, on not only our natural advantage, I'm just not sure natural advantage is enough. Um, you know, we need to uh, look at leveraging, building and leveraging some of the other um, capacities that, that we have. And people's obviously a, a big one, but we need the regulatory framework to support um, innovation and, and growth. And in WA, um, we've gone part of that way in aquaculture, but there's still um, a fair way to go. Um, and as I said, we need to build the capacity for investors to have confidence in building new industries and growing new industries in, in WA. Thanks, Brett. Yeah, I think that from a commercial fishing perspective and even tourism perspective for recreational fishing, the, the natural advantage is known to us, but similar to what Mark was saying, we haven't spent the time or the effort to go and tell people about that natural advantage. And, People think because we produce a high quality lobster or a high quality prawn, it'll sell itself. Um, and it does to a certain extent until the buyers like now say, no, we're not going to buy it. Um, we've got a, a number of our more forward thinking companies that are doing that internationally. But as an industry overall and as a state, I don't think we do that as well about selling our natural advantage of the marine environment we have. And certainly from a commercial product perspective, I believe we could have a far greater demand arrangement around the world than we do by getting out there and promoting our product a bit more. I don't really know of any major investment by the industry over my 40 years in it where they've invested in a, a five-year program to promote their product, um, even within Australia, let alone overseas, and I think you'd all probably never seen things about the fishing industry putting that. That may be the generational change that Rob's talking about. Um, we had a strong Southern European influence through the industry. There's a strong paternalistic approach to what it does. Um, maybe that'll change as, as we move through to the new generation of, of fishermen. And, and as I think there's more of a corporate approach to coming into the industry, um, families are still a significant part of it, but, uh, but corporations are now starting to take an interest in ag investment and fishing starting to, to pull, pull ahead a bit with that. But um, I think we need to build on it by going and telling people what we've got here. Carmen. I'll be very short and sweet. Um, I think that to grow on uh, economic advantages through our natural benefits, then we really need to have a systems-based understanding of what we do and what we want to achieve out of our natural resources. At the moment, we're very sectoral-based in developing our plans and our strategies. I think that what we need is sort of a, a broader ocean's vision for 
the state. Thank you. What investment opportunities or impact investment opportunities are available for investors? Brett? Uh, well, building on what I said before, I think the investment opportunities are now in the certainty in your business. I think any business requires certainty. Um, if in the old days you knew tomorrow you could be closed down, why would you put any long-term thinking into your business? So now that that, uh, that certainty is better, it's still not as good as it could be. Uh, a rock lobster licence worth five to ten million dollars can still be taken away at the whim of, a, uh, of politics, um, which is not a best way of being able to build your business, but at least there's a few more steps in place. So um, property nature in fishing licences should be something that's, uh, that's strongly considered. And then you'll get people come in and say, well, maybe I'll give you the, the money you need to do that. As Rob was saying in aquaculture, growing fish in some cases isn't hard, growing it for a profit's the hard one. And uh, back in the 80s, we learnt quite a bit about how to grow fish for a loss or to go out of business. But I think... Um, Becoming more corporate, becoming more of a business mentality rather than a livelihood or a, um, a way of life is, is certainly where commercial fishing's going at the, at the top end and I think we've just got to build it through the rest of the industry. Rob. Yeah, reflecting uh, what Brett said and what I've said earlier, I think there's you know, lots of uh, capacity for investment, new investment, impact investment in aquaculture. Uh, it's a matter of picking the right species for the right system for the right location, which hasn't always been the case in the past. Um, and I think, um, you know, hopefully the success of some of the other listed companies and new companies coming to market and uh, obtaining private equity and other capital will uh, bolster the success. The other sort of area, emerging area of impact capital is actually in the Indigenous space. Um, there's growing movement in Australia in the Indigenous and Aboriginal space to look at what has happened in New Zealand where the iwi, the Maori uh, people uh, own uh, majority of the fisheries uh, licences and um, aquaculture in uh, New Zealand and, and license it to other companies, but there's growing amounts of Indigenous capital being deployed now looking at uh, investment in um, aquaculture and fisheries in, in Australia and um, that, that's a good thing for, for uh, Indigenous empowerment, um, but it also provides an opportunity for co-investment for other investors and other operators. Thank you. We've got a few minutes for questions, so um, if anyone has a question, we have a microphone just just to uh, the right of the room there. No? Okay. Well, I can ask one final question. Given Australia's current... Oh, please. Sorry, we need a microphone. So, Dirk, you mentioned um, data transparency and data security and one thing that might be missing there. Have you looked at um, how blockchain might assist with that? Uh, yes and no. We, we're scratching our head around blockchain at the moment a little bit. Um, it's a, in our field, relatively new and emerging technology. Um, so we haven't specifically investigated it, but it's also on the list, right? And in, in, a, in a way, I'm, I'm lumping this into what I call artificial intelligence, which is all software processing technologies, right? And the only reason I mention that is um, in other industries, uh, the combination of machine learning, AI, big data, and blockchain is emerging now. Yeah. I wrap that in. <laughs> Anyone else? Yes, in the back there. Do you, sure. There's a microphone just here, if you could come up. Sorry, it's just because of the live recording, we'll actually need you on the mic. I think Marianne's just going to bring that through and over to you now. Oh, lovely. Thank you, sir. I love how all of you hid in the back of the room. We've still got you all to Thank come you. forward a little. Uh, Dirk, this, this one's for you. It's, um, I'm from the UNESCO Intergovernmental Oceanographic Commission and we have a adjunct membership role with the Oceans Institute at UWA. and. Uh, be very interested in talking to you about how we might be able to connect our international constituency, particularly in the Indian Ocean Rim and uh, East Africa, 
in the capacity development realm. And Great. The, yeah, and the overarching um, landscape for that in the next 10 years may well be perhaps the establishment of a, of a, a node in Perth, Western Australia uh, for the UN Decade of Marine Science for Sustainable Development and Capacity Development and trying to uh, enable and, and harness ways to connect our overseas emerging early career scientists with institutes like those in Western Australia and it has a blue economy um, relevancy. I think that's, there's a big opportunity there. You and I will talk. Yeah, sure. <laughs> And on talking, one of the things I found so interesting about the discussion, I spent many years working on the Vincent Enfield project off Exmouth for Woodside, and it struck me that as we talked to Kalis and the fisheries and the whale researchers and the, the variety of different users of our oceans, and um, I think, Carmen, as you highlighted, the need sometimes for planning, but also conversations around the shared capacity, the shared research, the shared learnings um, that we have across those great sectors that are all deriving, I guess, income from our economy, but perhaps not realising where their synergies lie. And, if, you know, we can start to plan seismic vessels around whale movements. You know, there's so much more we could do, I think, to actually turn that into something really positive. Um, so some great discussion there. One final question, and then we'll be moving to our next panel. Thanks very much. Um, just a general question. Uh, when, um, Brett, you're talking about you learned how to grow fish at a loss. To what extent do you think the, uh, I guess the ecological function of the ocean is properly priced into the price of the goods that we consume? And should there be something that we should be looking at that to, I guess, make aquaculture and grown fish more competitive? Oh, sorry. Yeah, my comment with regards to growing fish was a loss was as an observer of what's happened in aquaculture during the 80s. Rob's probably better at answering that one now in regards to the current, uh, the current aquaculture pricing arrangements. Yeah, our, our industry uh, globally in, in Australia has tended to focus on a high value species because of the margin and um, on this premise of us being the food, ch the food bowl of, of Asia and, and that dream's starting to uh, um, potentially uh, uh, become a nightmare at the moment for many industries. Um, the reality in Australia in seafood is that we actually eat more imported seafood than we, we eat our domestic product. And maybe the, uh, this whole China trade spat provides both a need and an opportunity for more domestic seafood. But that's probably going to have to come at a, uh, at, at a price point. Um, people um, have indicated they are prepared to pay more for Australian sourced seafood but how much more hasn't really been tested yet? Um, so, you know, certainly, you know, paying $100 a kilo for lobsters at Christmas time probably won't go down, um, but at a more competitively priced um, point where there's at least cash flow generated for, for prawns and lobsters and abalone and other things like that, may see more domestic seafood in our, in our diets in Australia, which has got to be a good thing, um, and also might support a breadth of the industry and... Um, and other aspects developing. I think that price point is such an important part of the conversation, both from a, a supply point of view, but certainly even what we're hearing from our exporters around, you know, the government saying, we'll go and just diversify the market when you've been getting $100 a kilo and you're now faced with 40 potentially in Japan or Singapore, you know, there is a big difference in that better than zero. And that links back to then what do we pull it out of the water at um, and how do we get better at doing that as well so that we protect ourselves there. Um, Chris, I'm curious, can you, can you tell us a bit more about um, you know, what makes Western Australia attractive and well positioned um, for your industry? And, and what relationship does that have to the health of the ecology or, or how well we manage our marine environment? Uh, so I'm, not, I'm Chris, not sure. Chris I'm, is from Super Yacht Australia. <laughs> so I'm not sure I'm going to be able to uh, comment too much on the ecological side of it, but I, I guess just to give a little bit of a perspective on um, well, context to where we sit globally. Um, the West Australian or Australian shipbuilding industry obviously is quite young compared to other places in the world, like Germany and Holland and places like that when it comes to Super Yachts, for example. Um, but we uh, have, do very well at punching above our weight 
um, you know, companies like Austel, for example, are world leaders in high-speed aluminium technology with fast ferries, and now they're in the defence sector in the US and, and so on and so forth. Um, when it comes to super yachts, we've had fantastic companies like Oceanfast in the past. Um, we've now got Silver Yachts and Echo Yachts in WA. We're the only two, there's only two companies in Australia building this sort of vessel, and they're both here in Henderson. Um, and realistically, we're the only two companies now really in the Southern Hemisphere that are building large luxury vessels like this now. Um, there's, you know, the opportunities, I guess, for us are um, three, threefold. Uh, I think, first of all, as, as an industry, it's um, new builds. Uh, also, refit, maintenance, repair would be the second part of that. And the third part of it is, uh, uh, you know, ocean or natural tourism. Um, and, you know, what, what we offer, I think, is world class. I've, I've had the opportunity to travel the world with my job over the last 22, 23 odd years. Um, I've been to all the major yacht shows and I've toured some of the leading shipyards in Germany and Holland and, and Italy and places like that. Um, and what we achieve here is, is up there with the best in the world. It's just that as a nation, and I, I wonder sometimes if this is a bit of a, a cultural thing, we don't do well at selling ourselves overseas. There's certain nationalities, uh, you know, that turn up at these yacht shows that, you know, dress up flamboyantly and basically shout from the hilltops of how awesome they are and how great their product is and, and all the rest of it. Um, and uh, when you get to know the industry, you realise that well, they're the ones that probably should be doing the least shouting from the hilltops. You know, whereas the Australians and even New Zealanders, for example, are quite modest. You know, we, I think, and that maybe comes back to sort of that Australian tall poppy syndrome. Um, and that probably crosses over onto what people were talking about before, with, you know, seafood and, and things like that. Maybe we just don't sell ourselves and our assets or what we've got to offer well enough overseas. So I'm curious, um, just also to give us a bit of context about the, the sort of super yacht shipping space, what's the, and you said we're, relative, we're not as mature as some, some other markets, what are, what are the lead times in, in your sort of industry? Um, a, a lot of people, quite a few people here are from the sort of startup sector and to, to mature a startup ecosystem in a city, you know, it takes a decade, it takes a bunch of exits, um, it takes a long time to get a company going. How long does it take to, to sell the super yacht? How long does it take to sort of grow an industry? Well, if you look at, so <clears throat> in my personal opinion, I'd say the, the two largest, or the two countries that built the largest, most complex super yachts traditionally have been Germany and Holland. Um, and there's companies there that have been around, they haven't always built super yachts, because super yachts are probably only sort of a 30, 40 year old phenomenon at best but their companies go back 100 years or more, you know, family-owned companies. So from a, from a, I guess from a, um, a branding perspective, they've got that heritage behind them, so that really helps them. Um, whereas in Australia, um, and Mark's probably a better place to, to sort of give, give the insight on this, but, uh, you know, I would sort of say our industry for super yachts in particular is probably 30 years old at best, uh, and that's going back to some of the earlier ones that were a lot simpler than what we're talking about now. Um, so there's that. Uh, as far as how long it takes, um, I mean, we, um, we've worked on some of our contract leads for, say, maybe six months. Uh, others we've worked on for maybe a year and a half or something before something's come to fruition. So there's a long uh, gestation period to begin with, and there's a lot of um, effort and a lot of money that needs to be spent on that. You've got to go visit clients abroad or overseas, you know, interstate or whatever the case might be. Uh, so there's a, there's a big outlay just, just to do that in the first place. And then when you come to build it, the White Rabbit project, for example, from a blank sheet of paper, from first discussion through to, through to delivering the vessel, um, that was a four and a half year process. Um, but, you know, when you've got, for instance, here in WA, two companies, each company could easily, easily be building two large vessels simultaneously, overlapped in their respective facilities. Um, you know, that means you could be putting out, you know, one and a half vessels a year. The cheapest vessel, you know, the, I, think a, I think the average in Australia for a super yacht is 1.6 million Australian dollars per lineal metre for a yacht. So if you talk, if you, if you look at, say, 
you know, even if you're putting out a small super yacht at, say, 50 metres, yeah. uh, you know, you could be talking $60 million, $50, $60 million. Um, but if you're putting out big ones, like White Rabbit, then potentially you could, you know, OK, if you're putting out one a year, that could be a $200 million proposition. And, you know, 300 people employed on the project locally here, living in Fremantle, guests flying in and all, the, all of the flow-on effect that comes from that. It's huge. It's, it's one of the biggest opportunities I see here outside of mining oil and gas. Yeah. And, and the government seems to know nothing about it. Even well, they, we they do to now, so... <laughs> 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 Hurrah to us. <laughs> and to you and Mark for joining us today. Um, I, I did touch on that theme, sort of time frames and value, um, and want to pick up now, uh, Alex, uh, you've been doing some work with the um, Australian Ocean Energy Group, and in um, your fantastic video, which I really enjoyed, um, prior to this forum, you, you talked about leapfrogging, um, uh, looking at the comparative um, lead time for um, solar um, to get traction and wind to get traction, and that wave energy, how could we speed up the growth of the wave energy industry in Western Australia? Yeah, great question, Andrew, thanks. Um, it's interesting, you know, there's a number of barriers to wave energy uh, adoption. Um, there's been technical barriers, there's been, um, you know, barriers with uh, understanding of markets about the potential, and there's also been political barriers, um, you know, in terms of the policy settings to promote innovation and uh, adoption of wave energy. And that's, that's probably one of the most significant hurdles that we need to tackle at the moment. Um, really encouraged today uh, to see the launch, um, Australia being involved in a launch yesterday of the ocean, a uh, sustainable ocean economy, along with 14 other nations, and actually uh, starting to put on paper uh, not just some of its goals in that area, but also what they're calling an action plan. And there's a, uh, a webinar later this afternoon, I'm sure a lot of you guys will be uh, participating in that, hosted or opened by the Prime Minister and uh, hosted in part by the Minister for Environment. And ocean energy is one of the, uh, the four or five key priorities that are going to be discussed during that webinar today. And I'll just read you a snippet of the, uh, the high-level briefing document in preparation for that. And uh, they say, scaling up ocean-based renewable energy will generate jobs and boost economic development while providing a pathway to de decarbonization. An ocean-based renewable energy revolution is in the making, and recovery efforts provide an opportunity to increase investment over the coming years. So this is the first, um, well, that's the first good articulation I've heard from our Commonwealth government about the importance of ocean energy. And I'm hoping very much that, that uh, sets the pace. You know, we've got um, our government, along with many others, are, are paying you know, lip service to uh, transition to renewables, uh, that's perhaps not happening at a pace that uh, a lot of us would be happy with. Uh, but the identification of ocean energy is part of that mix of renewables. And I say part of the mix because there's no renewable energy source which is going to be the panacea or the one size fits all for a, a transition away from fossil fuels. They each have their place. I guess in Australia we're very, very fortunate in the ocean energy space to have the right characteristics. Uh, in terms of our high tidal ranges in the northern part of the country and Western Australia in particular, and that beautiful wave pattern uh, that you know comes unimpeded from the the Southern Ocean, with that huge fetch, fetch which provides optimal, um, I guess, input for wave energy technology going forward. The the themes that you've identified and are, are pretty consistent. There's there's really there's really three. Um, there's an identified need to develop a more shared understanding of what the blue economy is and what it might, um, what it might be in the future for, for Western Australia and I guess probably the Indian Ocean Rim. There's a great desire to see greater coordination um, and um, I guess governance around the, the sector and to, to see that in terms of alignment um, around decision making and prioritisation, and there's a desire to see um, us all working across our different pillars and, and, and areas of expertise. So I guess starting with that first, um, that, that, that first insight about developing a shared understanding of what's possible. Andrew, you've, you've given a lot of thought to this probably um, over the last few years in the, in the development of, the, of for Blue. Um, 
how can we start to build that shared understanding and impetus um, amongst the broader community about what's possible within, within the blue economy? Mm. Well, probably one of the most important things is that we are each and all ambassadors for it. Um, that there isn't going to be someone else appointed, but it's, it's us, you know, who are involved in marine or maritime industries or anything that's ocean related. I don't want to get, I wouldn't recommend getting too hung up on the definition of the blue economy because in other sectors such as social enterprise or startups that becomes the big focus and studies get paid for but it doesn't actually um, particularly advance the core of it and I think there's fantastic work being done by institutions like the UN and federal government that define it sufficiently that we can yeah, move forward on it. Um, but I think it's forums like this and um, yeah, the work we, we did in producing the um, Facing Our Future Prospectus or the Phase 1 report for For Blue that identifies nine specific areas of opportunity so we can focus on them um, to identify where are our strengths and put energy um, and investment and attract talent to those areas. So I think there's something there about we're all responsible. <laughs> Don't get too hung up on the definition, but be aligned in a very, very long-term vision, like thinking 2100 or, you know, that we're, we're, not, we're not going anywhere. <laughs> the way we relate to the ocean has to be consistent, but then being really focused in, okay, what, what, what are we practically going to do in which industry or which sector next? Fantastic, thanks. Uh, Danisha, from, I guess, someone who's working across networks, um, do you have any reflections about how we can build that common understanding of potential? Yeah, a couple of things really spring to mind. And I guess even in the conversation, so much of what we're talking about, be it, you know, the, the southern infrastructure routes or the, the infrastructure harbours or visioning and planning that, the, you know, the Department of Transport are doing here across harbours up and down the coast, right through to our researchers and our scientists. Um, there is some incredible synergies within other industries and other sectors. And I think one of the great things about being part of, for example, the Chamber is we formulated a Greater Fremantle Action Plan four years ago and each year we set two or three key priorities. But having those priorities front of mind, as Andrew said, enables you to go into conversations and take responsibility because you know what those messages are and you know what that direction is. And I think, you know, in this room there's an awful amount of power and clout and even just having today's conversation that's refined the conversation down to governance, to technology, to you know, skills and talent and to, I guess, a potential overall brand that we all share, which is this passion for this incredible coastline that we have. If those themes are front and centre of every conversation that we're having at all levels of government, be it federal, state or even locally here, then that's how we make a really strong difference and stay focused on those themes, as Andrew said. Fantastic. Thank you. And that leads... That leads probably Frank into any any reflections on governance and, and I guess how local government um, can can lead I guess in in terms of developing these opportunities yeah thanks Jason um, I, I suppose I first want to pick up on one of the points that Denisha made and that was in regards to skills and talent and I think the the real opportunity is about getting the like-minded technical experts such as yourselves in that similar geographic location. And, you know, we, we have here in Western Australia that opportunity on the Indian Ocean rim to really be able to create that hub, if you like. And, and if we're talking about from Fremantle down to Henderson, um, how do we start to talk about that area as being the, the industry leader uh, uh, globally even? Uh, one of the other points to, I suppose, pick up on is around skills and talent, when we are able to get those like-minded people into the same room, um, a, a location as, such as Fremantle and a role that we can play is to start to advocate uh, with state governments, start to ad advocate with um, other corporations. And, um, you know, I think we have the great opportunity here at the moment to be able to attract that talent to Fremantle. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with Fremantle itself, you know, local government plays that role of um, growing growing communities and, and we're going through a fantastic revitalisation um, ourselves at the moment and the kind of environment that we have in Fremantle will attract uh, smart, young, 
uh, savvy people who want to make a change and want to develop an industry. So I think that's one of the roles that local government can, can play is to attract talent uh, by creating that environment for them. Fantastic, thanks. And Mark, in terms of working across, I guess, all of our individual silos, whether that's research, government, in, um, different industry sectors, um, have you, what's your experience in that to date and where do you see that there might be some opportunities? Well, if, I, I don't think any of this will really work unless you know, the, the Fremantle Council and the community as a whole have, have embraced all of these ideas entirely. And I think it's fair to say in the past that the, the council and the community in Fremantle have been somewhat resistant to change. Would that be fair? And it's encouraging to hear that you've, you, you believe that the council itself has been revitalised. But, you know, it, it really needs to be the reality. Otherwise, all of this will just spin, spin the wheels. And um, pr provided that happens and we get traction and, and, and good projects and ideas get support, then we will get somewhere. And what we have to do is get back to what happened in 1987 when we had the America's Cup. 18 months before the Cup, this place was very run down. And within 18 months, it had a total transformation. So whatever you guys did back then, go and get those old guys back <laughs> and, and make it happen again. Because that's what's got to happen. Because the place is dead now, I'm telling you. Can I just add one thing on that? In the 80s, you know, this whole strip just down to our right was designated by Department of Transport for marine industries. And now we have at least five to six empty warehouses sitting down there just waiting for somebody to come into them. But they have to have a marine theme. If anyone in this room wants to take that up, you know, there's a hub, there's a space. It's already designated in the 80s from planning to help this place grow and to be that hub. Um, but we're just not utilising even some of that infrastructure. Oh, Rob? Can I just very quickly just respond to Mark's point in regards to Fremantle? Um, <laughs> uh, I, I suppose, I, yeah, I do take a, a little bit of an affront to that, but, you know, the point is absolutely right. We need to create the kind of environment which uh, encourages that investment, encourages that development. And, um, you know, we have been doing that for some time, and I think over the next sort of five years we're going to see that um, revitalisation which... Uh, will create that kind of environment to enable, you know, the right kind of industries to develop in Freo. Thanks, Frank. Rob? Sorry, to take up that point, uh, it would be remiss of me to not dob someone in here. Uh, is Michaela Demise still here? Um, in Perth, we are very fortunate to actually have the Mindaroo Foundation, or Tatarang, who've made a massive investment in a number of areas of the blue economy at the moment. Um, Michaela, are you able to maybe make a few comments about the three or four areas that you're working in? A little bit taller than me. Um, yeah, hi everyone. I'm uh, Michaela from the Mindaroo Foundation. So we actually have two, two, two entities. Mindaroo is a foundation and then we have Tatarang, which is the commercial arm of the forest family. And that has heavily invested in a lot of the blue economy around uh, Western Australia. As, uh, as Rob would well know, lots of initiatives in aquaculture, um, exciting new species being introduced into the market, which we're all very, very proud of. Um, but also a family who's very uh, proud of Western Australia and proud of the, of the blue economy and, and would like to see that succeed. So very happy to be here today and hear about all the exciting um, ideas and, um, and uh, causes moving forward. Thanks. Fantastic. Thanks, Michaela. Um, and I guess that was probably a lead-in to, to the next question, which is, I guess, that, that enabling, um, the enabling infrastructure and the enabling investment that we need to see to, to realise some of this potential and, and, and what sort of, I guess, sources and what sort of energy can pe the people in this room bring to, to resourcing um, the sorts of outcomes that we're seeking. Invite anyone, any reflections? I'll just talk quickly and uh, from a city perspective. and. To kind of go back to the question Denisha asked early in the day about uh, our perception of ourselves in regards to the ocean and how we would describe it. Um, I couldn't come up with a particular term, but the thing that I uh, thought about for myself and for, for Fremantle was in regards to being open and almost standing out on that headland and looking and trying to understand what those opportunities are. So. Um, as I mentioned earlier, what, what we would be seeking from this group and, and like-minded people is about the ideas, 
Uh, we don't have the ideas ourselves as to how we can make this work the best, but what we want to do is be able to speak to uh, those industry leaders who, um, you know, like Mark, have very strong ideas about where things need to head and how we can then look at facilitating those. Um, I guess wearing my, my chamber hat, one of the things I think that we can offer is a connection of the dots. Um, one of the things we saw through COVID and particularly with our lobster industry when it was hit so quickly is, you know, most of our exporting clients who come to us every day to stamp documents, we're a first port of call for when things hit, we know it immediately because the phone's not ringing and your documents aren't coming through. Um, to be our, we were called upon by DFAT and by the federal government very, very quickly to say, what's the word on the ground? Because you guys are at the forefront of making that happen and I went to the opening of the Indonesian Trade Expo um, two weeks ago representing the Chamber and you know fascinating conversation with the Council General just about spices obviously not related to the marine industry but certainly very related to trade. Um, the Council General, her export team and the Commissioner for Jakarta is coming down to the Chamber for morning tea next week um, to meet with Fremantle Ports and some of our you know traders and exporters um, that are looking for a new market. Those conversations and connecting those dots when we do sit on the veranda in many senses, um, we represent a great diversity of industry. We're fortunate enough to have Tatarang and Mindaru as our you know, members. Um, we've got Fremantle Ports as one of our key partners. We'd love to be involved in connecting those dots. So please, if you're not members already, you know, join up or give me a call and, and just see if we can at least connect you to someone who may know something else. Fantastic. Um, Maybe unless there's any comments, a final, a final question is we, we've heard a lot from um, our established industry players who are doing an amazing piece of work, but we've been remiss to, to not recognise we're part, we're part of West Tech Fest here and, and looking to foster innovation and the next generation of industry and activity coming through. What, what can we do collectively to support innovation and startups in this space? Well, one of the things that I think that we lack as a society, and this is true worldwide, is that this constant push for everyone to go to university. And not everyone learns um, sort of in that, in that forum. And, you know, I've spoken a lot about apprenticeships and whatnot, you know, in my talk today. There's a lot of people out there that I know that learn very well on that forum. And you need the people on the ground to be building this kit and we're talk, talking about a lack of resources and things like that, I think there, there needs to be a real focus on identifying who best learns through the university system and who best learns through the, the, the you know, look, see, feel, touch system, more mechanically minded. And, um, and that way we will we'll grow the whole community properly because it's not all just intellectually based. You know, that's, that's just my five cents worth. And it sounds like, um, from your experience and from the experience of some of the others in, in your field, that, that you need to have that, that experience, that hands-on, to understand the business, um, to, to then be... Well, that's been my experience. And I know for a fact in the States they're struggling to get anyone to build houses or anything anymore because they just physically don't have anyone working on the ground. And, you know, with the resistance of getting the Mexicans in and all that sort of stuff to do the, the menial tasks, the Americans don't want to do it. You know, they've gone to uni. You know, they want to be accountants and lawyers and all this sort of stuff. But someone's got to build stuff. Hmm. Um, Andrew? Yeah, um, so t two things. One is to the difference between um, going for a run or being a runner or growing the blue economy or like being an ocean person. And 91% of Western Australians live on the coast. Um, you know, 50% of our um, so 50% of our oxygen like comes from the ocean, 20% of our protein, 20% of our fresh water comes from D cell, like we're deeply connected and I think we have in a way not recognised but we really are an island nation um, of the ocean and I think adopting that sort of cultural identity is very foundational. The second thing is, um, and this is in the Facing Our Future prospectus which is a copy out the back, is um, really this idea of a, a super cluster, um, as in recognising that there is a lot of overlap and shared opportunities and shared challenges across marine industries, and yet we don't really have a mechanism or a way um, or not resourced to identify those shared challenges and get after them. 
um, but say the subsea innovation cluster Australia is a good, good micro example, but we can expand that. And I mention that because that's very aligned with the um, you know, West Tech Fest, which is happening this week. Um, it, it builds on that um, geographic co-location um, and it makes it much easier um, to attract investment and, ta and talent. And I think for Western Australia, if we decide we are ocean people, if we embrace that, um, that identity, then yeah, marine industries can be the most attractive to talent and investment in Western Australia. And we do it not just for us, because it's bloody good for the world. Like we're really good at it, really in an incredible position, and the world needs help with its oceans right now. Um, so yeah, something bigger than ourselves as well. Fantastic, thank you. Well, that's probably a pretty good note to finish um, this, this panel on. So thanks, thanks very much for everyone's input. Thanks so much, Jason. And I'm very pleased to say that we are directly on schedule and on time and we have covered so much information. I don't know about you, but my brain is completely reeling. Um, some really key takeouts for me, uh, that idea of planning and leveraging our talent, the value add and the care. And I think, you know, the scientists in the room and their passion for um, our beautiful marine environment and the care that it's going to take um, to protect that into the future. The infrastructure and the link to some of our hard systems and, and how we grow. The Indigenous space which we talked on and that role of connection and then the capacity building education and employment. Plus um, those wonderful comments just about social enterprise and the marine and coastal community networks and some of the, the passion that Andrew talked about and building on those that just have a true passion for our oceans and how we link them in both from a branding and marketing perspective, but also from a, a passion and doing perspective. Um, other than that, we are obviously more than welcome to pop down to Little Creatures or other places in our beautiful fair city uh, for some lunch and to continue the conversation. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Andrew and his team for Blue are going to be putting together a bit of an outcome and summary of today's discussion. Um, you probably heard me passionately talk about the role the Chamber has in keeping the conversation going. So do we have an advocacy page um, on the Fremantle Chamber of Commerce website um, and we'll be uploading uh, this video um, to that today. And I know the City of Fremantle and Glenn and Matt who are kindly standing up just as I mentioned their names to give a wave. Um, and uh, Frank and the team in the Economic Development Area at the City of Fremantle, if any of you are looking for ways to uh, relocate or to uh, bring your wonderful teams down this way, please don't hesitate to ask. Um, and finally, um, I guess the final thought is we all have a responsibility here, so let's please keep the conversation going. Contact Andrew, contact myself, contact the team at the city, um, contact each other, and um, just let's see where we can come in a, a few months' time when we regather again in the new year. Thanks all. <laughs>